spring. Uh, there's lots of information in the bulletin. If you're interested in the events that go on, please check them out or get on our website. Uh, we do need to offer a quick uh, prayer of thanksgiving this morning. If anybody watched the Wisconsin game last night, so. <laughs> although I have to admit to uh, mixed loyalties here because I went to seminary at Duke. And, uh, we don't hold it against you. The last time that they won the NCAA tournament was my last year at Sunday. That was a pretty exciting time to be on campus. So I'm gonna, I'll, uh, I'll stay out of it prayer-wise this time. I won't pick a side. So anyway, welcome to Mosby United Methodist Church. We are thrilled to have you with us on this glorious Easter morning. We started today with a sunrise service that our youth led and a, a bonfire outside as we welcome the light of Christ back into the world. And now as we come together to celebrate Easter together, we are going to just thoroughly celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have a prayer to begin with this morning. Uh, if you'll please join me in our century prayer. Easter morning, and we don't get understand. Dear Lord, the tomb is empty. Where are you, Jesus? We haste and help us to running through life, but getting no closer to true life. Help us to believe what we do not yet see. Messiah, Savior, you live. Good news for all people. Amen. Let's rise and sing together the perils of Christ.
are you guys doing today? Great! It's Easter Sunday. That's pretty cool. And uh, we, uh, when we celebrate Easter Sunday, we remember how surprised people were that morning. What happened the first time when uh, Mary and some of the ladies went to Jesus' tomb? They were expecting to find him dead, right? That's right, they were expecting to find a dead body, but all they saw were the clothes he'd been wrapped in when they put him in the tomb. Because he wasn't there anymore, was he? Right. So that was pretty surprising, and some of them were worried about that. Uh, and the disciples were running around. Yeah, the disciples were running around because they thought maybe somebody stole the body or something terrible like that. Uh, but Mary, Magdalene, stayed there beside the tomb, uh, and she was crying because she was so sad. Uh, uh, well, Jesus, this was Mary Magdalene, different Mary. Uh, Jesus was her friend. Uh, she was one of his followers, too. And it says that she was uh, standing there crying, and she looked inside, and there were a couple of angels inside the tomb. And the angels said, Dear woman, why are you crying? Why do you think she was crying? He was gone. Yeah, she said, they've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they put him. So she turned to leave, and she saw somebody standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Now, I don't know why she didn't recognize him. Do you think in white faces she might not have recognized Jesus? You're, <laughs> You're just one of the guys. Why? Why do you think she Well, yeah, they had seen each other for Days. That might be. She was crying really hard, so she had all those tears in her eyes. Sometimes it's hard to see real well if you have tears in your eyes. Uh, maybe the sun was shining. Maybe Jesus was looking glorious and different. I mean, the last time she'd seen him, he looked pretty bad. He was on the cross. So she didn't recognize him at first. And Jesus said to her, Dear woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? And it says, uh, the Bible says that Mary thought he was the gardener. She thought he was the guy that worked in the garden there. And she said, sir, if you've taken him away, just tell me where you put him and I will go again. And then Jesus said, Mary. And that's all it took. And it says she turned and cried out, teacher. And she gave him a big hug. Isn't that nice? Yeah. Um, there's a couple of times in here that it talks about Mary turning around. She turns away from the empty tomb and she sees Jesus and she doesn't see it's him. And then when he calls her name, she turns again and recognizes him. And I think we have turning points in our lives. Uh, you know, sometimes people talk about, well, I just don't feel like God is, is there with me. I'm going through some tough stuff right now and I don't feel like God is there. But it might be that kind of like Mary, Jesus is there, and we just don't recognize him at first. And sometimes we have to kind of turn ourselves around uh, to see Jesus. We have to turn around our attitude. We have to recognize that uh, God loves us and look for where God might be. Sometimes it just takes a whole turning of our heart uh, to turn from that real, real sadness into joy and hope that, hey, Jesus is alive. And that means that the bad stuff is not going to last. So I hope that you guys have some turning points where things just suddenly look better for you. Okay? Let's have a prayer. Lord, we thank you for this Easter Sunday. Uh, it's a reminder of the biggest turning point in the history of the whole wide world when you turned everything around so we didn't have to worry about death anymore and we could celebrate life because we know that we will be resurrected will live with you forever. And you are the first sign of that, and you give us tremendous hope. Lord, call our names. Help us to see you when we see one. We will rejoice. Amen. All right, thanks, guys. We have a, a real blessing this morning. Eileen Fox is going to share some uh, personal testimony.
became a member of the Mosley United Methodist Church in October 2009. I had been uh, coming to this church off and on for a while by then, but prior to this, I did not attend a church regularly. I was baptized and raised as a Catholic. I attended Sunday school, had my first communion, and also went through confirmation. My grandfather, who I was very close to, had passed in 1985, and I continued to attend the Catholic Church on Christmas and to do my confirmation classes. But it was mainly for him and not for me. I wanted to make him proud even if he wasn't here. I was angry at God then and couldn't understand why he took the one man in my life that I felt safe with away from me. After finishing up and getting confirmed by the Catholic Church, I really didn't attend it. I joined the service in 1993 and pretty much let my faith falter. I have had a hard time in understanding some things that God would let happen to anybody, especially children. When my grandpa passed, I really didn't yet have a good grasp on God. I struggled and faltered for a lot of years. Alcoholism was a major struggle for me. I am so grateful for the support I had and learned that I didn't have to understand, I just needed a higher power. That was when I started attending this church more regularly. I felt welcomed by everyone, and at that time, Pastor Jim was here, and he just reminded me so much of my grandpa. He was so caring and loving, always had a hug for me. And my son was also already attending here with his dad and his stepmom. I sat with Pastor Jim and we discussed my joining the church and becoming a member. At this time, I hadn't been sober for all that long. He had shared with me at this time that somebody that I would have never thought had asked to pray for me when I went to Tomo VA to attend a dependency program. I was floored and cried a lot that day. It meant the world to me that even though I messed up so bad and I could have been killed or killed somebody else, that this person would ask for prayers for me. What an act of kindness, and I wanted to be like her. I knew that if I put my faith in God like this person did, that it might just be possible for me also. And it wasn't that I didn't believe in God. I always had and I always do and did. I just had a hard time understanding him in the Bible. So I became a member of this church and started coming more regularly and enjoying it and the music, but really wasn't stepping up yet or stepping forward to do anything about my lack of understanding. It hasn't been until the last year that I've actually put forth the effort to have a better understanding. The love and support from the church and its members through some of my most difficult times was what wanted me to have a better understanding. By attending Bible study with women that have been also attending has been a godsend. I have shared more with these ladies about my doubts and fears than I ever thought possible. And they are understanding and help guide me to a better understanding that I desperately want and need. I also enjoy working with Tina Kramer and our youth group. The kids in that group show me that believing and having an unfailing love for God is all I really need. The rest will come with patience, time, and love. And from Proverbs 3, um, verses 5 and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lead it not on your own understanding, in all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight.
As we enter into our time of prayer, I'm going to uh, uh, offer up a prayer for all of us. Uh, uh, give us some silence to so offer it within our hearts, and then we have some prayer requests that have been shared this morning. And uh, I ask that you all join with me as we lift this up to the Lord. Uh, prayer is the work of people, it is what we do uh, as we uh, bear the concerns of the world to our Lord, because He is the one who has the power to make a difference. Go ahead and bow our heads. Lord God, we are so grateful for this Easter morning, for resurrection, for joy. This is a, a world in desperate need of new life, of living water, and you bring it to us in abundance, uh, more than we can imagine, more than, uh, more than we can even comprehend. Lord, thank you for the gifts that people are offering to you this morning all around the world. Gifts of song, of worship, gifts of hearts that are changed. Lord, we pray that you will continue to work in us, make us for Easter people, so that we live lives full of full of resurrection, full of joy. Lord, we want to come to you this morning bearing those, uh, those concerns that are weighed upon our hearts, lifting up the joys for the blessings that have touched us this week, things that we haven't taken the time to properly think about or to offer up to you. Lord, for these prayers that we have lifted up, uh, we ask for a special attention. And Lord, where we can be the answer to someone's prayers, we pray that you will, you will motivate us, call upon us, send us, use us as the body of Christ in this world. This morning we've got some uh, uh, special concerns to lift up. Uh, there's some uh, triplets, little three-year-olds that are suffering from pneumonia. Uh, we pray for them. I want to lift up uh, little Benji, uh, who has a broken leg, and we pray for less pain, pain and swift healing. Uh, it's tough to be five and to be in a big cast like that. And Lord, as uh, we consider this church and the work that it does in the world, uh, we pray for all of our various mission projects. Uh, we celebrate the big ones like the mission trips uh, here and there, we Center of Hope, but every small mission makes a difference too. We've seen the, the amazing witness of our Sunday school kids who bring in their, their nickels and their quarters and their dollars and who are able to raise enough money to buy cows and pigs and chickens and sheep or uh, people overseas who are trying to start out a farm and get a good start. But we pray that you continue to use us as your faithful people, work through us so that in ways small and large, your love is felt in this world. We give you thanks that we are your Easter people all the chosen and resurrected people. Amen. Amen. Please join me in our affirmation of faith this morning, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. Unless, of course, you believe something that was never 
there too in the first place. I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. That Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, as the scripture said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve apostles. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers. At one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died right now. Then he was seen by James, and later by all the apostles. Last of all, I saw him. Too long after the others, as though I had been born at the wrong time. For I am the least of all the apostles, and I am not worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted the church of God. But whoever I am now, it is all because God poured out his special favor on me, and not without results, for I have worked harder than all the other apostles. Yet it was not I, but God, who was working through me by his grace. So it makes no difference whether I preach or they preach. The important thing is that you believe what we preached to you. Amen. Please take a moment to pray. <coughs> Lord, may these words of mine, the thoughts and prayers of all of our hearts be acceptable and easy to you on this Easter resurrection. Amen. Okay, everybody knows some weird people. In fact, for a lot of folks, I am the weird person that they know. <laughs> but I was not the weirdest kid in high school. The weirdest kid in my high school was named Jeff. And uh, he went out one day and bought himself an old purse. They say he wanted a cheap car, and it was a Cadillac station wagon, so why not? Now, Jeff was weird, and he was a nerd, but for a while, that made him the coolest kid in school. We all wanted to ride in Jeff's car. It was fun to lay down in the back. When he pulled up a stoplight, you could sit up and wave. <laughs> and he'd roll into the uh, school parking lot with signs in the window saying things like, used coffins for sale. Think about that one for a minute. <laughs> used coffins for sale. Now, uh, here's another life of stranger than fiction story. In Korea, there is a man named Jung Joon, whose job is to nail people into wooden coffins. He does this every day. Except that Joon isn't an undertaker and the people aren't dead. He runs this business that he calls Coffin Academy which promises to help you appreciate life more by giving you a little taste of death. And for about $25, he'll nail you inside a coffin for 10 minutes of claustrophobic dark and silence. And some of those uh, who climb back out of the coffins describe it as really a euphoric feeling, a resurrection experience to come out of that coffin. Weird, but you got to make a living, I guess. <laughs> Next slide. Now, our scripture readings for Easter Sunday focus on another borrowed coffin. When Jesus died, his followers hastily laid him into a borrowed tomb. They intended to come back after the Passover to tend his body and really take care of it properly. Instead, they get the shock of their lives, an empty tomb, and a living Savior. John's Gospel describes those first breathless moments as Mary and Peter and John all see the tomb empty. They expect the worst, thieves, tomb raiders, but they experience the best their friend, alive. It doesn't stop there. Writing just about 20 years later, the Apostle Paul records over 514 witnesses who have seen the risen Christ, most of whom are still alive, he says. In other words, if you don't believe me, go ask them. And the last of these witnesses was Paul himself, who uh, saw Christ a few years after the others, as to one who was born at the wrong time, he says. But Paul's encounter with Christ on the road to Damascus literally changed his life from a legalist and a murderer into a person who would be the greatest evangelist the world has ever known. Paul, you could say, actually changed the world. The Christian faith has already, always been built on witness. We have the living witnesses recorded in Scripture, of course, but Christians still celebrate the resurrected Jesus Christ. And for most of us, that means that we have experienced the living presence of Christ at some point in our lives. Now, maybe we haven't seen Jesus with our eyes, although some have, and they've shared their stories with me, and that's always a privilege. 
but we have experienced Jesus' power in our lives, or we've heard a guiding and loving whisper at an opportune moment, or felt Christ's loving touch in the hands of a neighbor or a fellow church member, or enjoyed a profound sense of peace and comfort during a time of great stress and trouble. And when you encounter that kind of powerful love, you naturally want to share it. And so we become living witnesses to our living Lord, Jesus Christ. Life and death encounters tend to inspire urgency. I heard a, a story the other day, and actually, Jim, it kind of made me think of you. It was about a couple of guys that worked for the gas company. And uh, one was a little older, a little, little thicker maybe, and the other was a young fellow who thought he was all that. One day they parked their truck at the end of the street, and they were checking meters and uh, connections. They worked their way down the street from house to house. When they got to the last house, they waved at the lady in the window and went about their business. And then the younger man said to the older man, I'll race you back to the truck. Well, the older guy just took off. Uh, he didn't expect that. So the younger guy's grinning, and he manages to catch up with him. But to their surprise, the lady from the house passes them both. They get to the truck first. And as they stand there gasping for air, the older man asks the woman why she had raced with them. She said, hey, I figure if you see two gas guys running away from an area, you better be <laughs> You know, there's never, there's nothing quite like a close encounter with death to make you feel more alive. Mary ran away from the empty tomb to carry this bad news, and Peter and John ran toward the empty tomb to verify it. Paul was inspired by the risen Christ himself to work hard to travel the length of the known world preaching the good news. And I know many in this church who have been profoundly touched this past year by the deaths of some of our beloved brothers and sisters. And many of us live more urgent lives because of it, savoring the sweetness and the blessings of each day, and each day working hard for God's kingdom. Thanks. I pray for you uh, that you have personally experienced the power of the resurrected Jesus Christ to bring resurrection and newness into your own life. And if not, I pray that you've been touched by the eyewitness of a friend and had your own faith strengthened as you build toward that. But I also pray that this experience of Jesus, who died for our sins and rose to conquer death, and who did it all for you and for me, that this experience of the risen Christ inspires you to live with urgent passion, savoring each day and serving the Lord. We say Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. The question is, if Christ is risen, what are you going to do about it? What urgency does your life have to serve God? What are you going to do today? What are you going to do this week to share your faith and make another person's life better? Don't put it off. Do it today. The church is about active discipleship. As Eileen shared her testimony, uh, we find that our faith grows when we participate in the life of the church and the work of Christ. So if you haven't encountered Christ yet, I would urge you to serve Christ and you will meet Christ. Next. This urgency of living for Christ is the opposite of the world new way. I know a lot of people who kind of shamble through life like zombies. It's almost like the living dead. Ugh, get up in the morning, drink my coffee, go to work. Come home, eat dinner, watch TV, go to bed. Mm. I mean, that's just kind of a living death. And others, I know, fear the death that comes at the end of life. And still others wonder, well, what's going to happen after I die? What about the afterlife? Now, we're all a little hazy on this stuff. Are we resurrected immediately after death or at the end of times? What is heaven like? How exactly did Christ defeat sin and death? We're going to start a sermon series in the next few weeks. So during the month of April, we're going to look at these and other questions and wrestle with them. And I, I hope that you join us. On Easter, we remember and we celebrate Jesus Christ, the firstborn from the dead. And in the weeks ahead, we're going to dig into some of those other questions about death and eternal life. Death and life situations. Because we are alive each day, and that is only by God's grace and power. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. And let's go get him. Amen. <laughs>
I just stand and sing. Uh, this is a great Wesleyan hymn. Uh, Charles Wesley wrote this, and I would wager that most churches around the world are singing this today. Christ the Lord is risen to me.
take a moment and greet each other with the peace and grace of Jesus Christ.
thee, all glory, honor, and praise. For by your will all things are created, and all things are redeemed, all things have their being. Bless now these gifts that we offer, in thanksgiving for your great faithfulness. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to invite our communion assistants to come up this morning. We prepare to celebrate uh, communion today. I want to share with those who are guests that in the Methodist tradition, communion is open to all. Uh, Jesus said that uh, the Son of Man came into the world not to condemn it, but so that all might have life. And we believe that all means all. So if you would like to participate, you are certainly welcome to encounter Christ in the bread and the juice today. We take communion by intention. That means when you come forward, come with your hands together, and we'll give you a piece of bread. You can dip that in the juice and then eat both elements together. I will also have a tray of gluten-free wafers. So if you want one of those, come up on my side, which will be that side, uh, and uh, then you can have one of those as well. We're going to uh, celebrate communion with the Great Thanksgiving, uh, which is a traditional Christian liturgy dating back uh, over a thousand years. So please join with me. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and set before us the way of life. And so, with your people on earth and with all the company of heaven, we praise your name and we join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God, our Redeemed by his blood. 
By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in service to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Now, with the confidence of God's children, let us pray as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The table of the Lord is prepared. Please
we prepare to close our service today, I want to offer a heartfelt thank you to everybody who has helped to uh, bring this service together, all of our wonderful musicians who work together to make this happen, uh, the folks that prepare the PowerPoint, especially Mike. Mike has been working away here all the time. If you're visiting and you'd like to know more about this congregation where we live out the love of Christ as we encounter Him in our daily walk, then ask us. It's pretty neat. Uh, I'm sure you'd be you'd get a personal witness from about anybody if you ask for prayer. And uh, if you are in a situation where you would like some prayer, if you would like me to uh, spend some time with you as we look to see where Jesus might be in your life, then give me a call. I'm happy to spend that time as well. I hope that you will consider coming back to join us in the upcoming month as we uh, explore this interesting uh, uh, dynamic between life and death and uh, how it changes the way we live and how we look forward to the good news of God's eternal life. We're going to close now with a couple of fantastic Easter songs, so please rise up and sing.
It's good to remember that uh, Christians around the world and in Syria have faced persecution since the days of Paul the Apostle. And this is their continued and living witness. So glory to the Father who has woven garments of glory for the resurrection. And worship to the Son who is clothed in them at his rising. And thanksgiving to the Spirit who keeps them for all the saints. And blessings to God's people as we witness Easter to the world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.